Uh, thank you, Anita. Good afternoon. My name is Emmanuel. I'm a senior manager of the Institutional Development Support Unit in GTAC. And this is a webinar on one of our uh, most successful projects about uh, this South African National Space Agency's infrastructure hub. So this was, we got very excited when we saw that um, this important project was first uh, registered as a SIP, if uh, you know what that is. So a strategic infrastructure project uh, back, I think, in 2020. And it's not sufficient to be recognized as such. You have to go through a number of uh, hoops and that will be explained here. Uh, so this project uh, went through the scrutiny of Treasury, of the uh, Budget Facility for Infrastructure. Some of our colleagues are here from the Capital Projects Appraisal Unit. Um, and it was deemed that it was probably a very good project, but it needed the proposal for an infrastructure hub needed to be refined and it needed to show that it was basically bankable, right? So that's when I think in April 2021, uh, we we got uh, into this project with our colleagues from Sansa. Uh, the the CEO then was uh, Dr. Val Munsami, who um, whom we knew from previous uh, projects. He accompanied us for a while, and um, I cannot remember when, but I think earlier this year. Um, he left and he has been replaced by an interim CEO who is Mrs. Andiswa Mlisa, uh, who is in the room. So I would first like to uh, recognize uh, a few people before we start. So there's Michael Akers, uh, who, is, who was the project manager on this project and uh, we have Andreas Bertoldi, who is going to give us the presentation, who was the technical, the tech guy on all the financial analysis that needed to be done to produce a bankable uh, proposal. And then from the sensor side, uh, I would like to welcome and uh, thank them for being with us. Uh, Andy Swam Lisa, interim CEO, and uh, Brighton Jenna, who is the new Sensa CFO. Thank you very much for joining us. We really appreciate. We love to have our clients in the room uh, for for honest feedback. Uh, what I would like to do, colleagues, uh, without further ado, is to maybe give Andy Swa. Uh, uh, um, an opportunity to say, give a few introductory remarks. And this way, is that all right with you? I mean, I know I'm taking you by surprise. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you very, thank you, thank very you much, so much, um, Emmanuel. Am I am I audible? You are. Thank you. Okay. So, um, and we love to see your face. You can leave your camera yes. on. <laughs> My uh, camera keeps going on and off. <laughs> um, I don't have load shading. I don't. My system is acting as if there's load shading. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction, Emmanuel, and also for the invitation. So uh, we were quite chuffed when we saw that uh, the session this week was going to focus on um, on the space infrastructure hub, and uh, and share the journey that we've uh, we've worked with uh, with GTEC. I think. Um, the 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 colleagues will definitely give a very uh, good background into the into the project from a Sansa perspective. 
one of the one of the things that this project does is the growth trajectory that it sets Sansa Sansa on, and you mentioned um, the re the registration of the Gazette as a as a strategic integrated project. This was one of the major wins for us. I mean, like you say, it's not enough, but for us, it was one of the major milestones at first because the recognition of space infrastructure as as part of the um, overall infrastructure of the country um, is something that we've been advocating uh, advocating for for a while as well as as that recognition also works us very closely to how government recognizes the value of geospatial data and uh, in in this in decision making so that was a first milestone 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 win for us and then of course we've had to embark on this journey of uh, developing a feasibility study for a bankable project where the um, the GTEC colleagues have come uh, in to support us. We quite appreciated um, the, the fact that there is an entity like GTEC within, within government, because when government talks about being a capable state and, and also ensuring that the resources are used adequately, we do struggle sometimes with how do we leverage um, other government entities' capabilities at the same time as having this competitive um, a drive that National Treasury uh, uh, puts 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 upon us. So we were further quite happy to be able to partner with um, with JTEC on this. Uh, not only because uh, the charge out rates for JTEC are much more affordable, but also the skill set that the team um, the team comes with and the level of insight and and comparison that it could make with the journey that. Uh, GTEC has worked with infrastructure projects uh, for other government departments as well. So that was something that we quite uh, we quite we quite we quite welcomed uh, on on our on our side. So I'm not going to say much because I don't want to steal uh, the 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 journey from that uh, that Andreas and Michael are going are going are going to share with us. But one of the most uh, when I mentioned the the growth trajectory for 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 Sansa is when we looked at the space infrastructure hub. One of the realizations that we had was that it was actually going more than ten times in terms to grow the 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 this this the, the Sansa capability, including its 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 budget, which introduces a whole lot of changes that needs to happen in, in an organization to be able to run uh, from this level of magnitude to that level of magnitude. So it's been a wonderful journey for us. It's not over yet, um, as we will hear from the from the colleagues, but we're enjoying every minute of it. I do would like to, to just acknowledge one additional person who's actually on the call, because I'm also going to, I am going to have to duck out uh, in the middle, so I might not be here right until today the end, but I'll try to stay. Um, uh, so Eugene Avenant, uh, he's the, he's, he leads the, the this SIH leadership team uh, in Sansa and really the technical uh, uh, person in uh, that's driving this for us. So Eugene is on the call and I'm, and I'm sure he's going to be able to stay throughout, uh, throughout the call. So uh, for, to provide any, any feedback and support, but I do want to, to, to just end by saying the the one of the values for us in working with the GTEC team was working together. So GTEC did not come in as a consultant and 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 get information for us, go away and and then give us a report at the end. It was really a journey which enables us with someone like Eugene to actually say we can own the business case uh, at the end and we can feather the business case uh, at the end. So that 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 knowledge sharing. Um, way of working, we, we really, really appreciated, and and would make us come back uh, to GTEC more and more uh, uh, often to work with. So thank you so much, Emmanuel, and all the best to the team for presenting. I hope everyone finds the journey that we've walked uh, useful and some lessons to be learned. And just to advocate for space, hopefully this presentation that also provides awareness that we have a space agency in this country and how we can look at the space um, uh, infrastructure in conjunction to how we look at the, uh, at the rest of the, in, of the bulk infrastructure in the country, which are slightly different. Uh, so thank you so much. Thank you very much, Andy. So this is music to my ears to hear that our charge out rates are lower than the market and to hear from a client that our way of engaging is, is what they are looking for. Um, it makes our day to hear that. I would just also like to uh, 
um, indicate to colleagues that uh, Boitomelo Mashilo is in the room and he is uh, our number one infrastructure, infrastructure uh, person in, in, in GTAC. Uh, he is uh, very, very active in that circle. Uh, yes, Andiswa? No, I saw your hand. Maybe you no, wanted to clap. I wanted I wanted to say hi to Boitomelo. Okay, <laughs> so you know Boitomelo, uh, he plays a very big role in infrastructure, uh, more and more prominently. And inside GTAC, uh, he really uh, is involved with the budget office on all these issues of infrastructure proposals. So a very important uh, role player in our environment. And then I'm going to leave this to, to Andreas, uh, leave the presentation to you, Andreas. And maybe as an introduction, I would like to say that when I met the colleagues at Sansa, a few years ago, uh, what really struck me was how, how little we know about the space uh, infrastructure and how very little we know about what that means, but how much we use it. So uh, maybe Andreas or Michael, you can first tell us, you know, what what does it mean? What what is it? Are we building stuff in the sky? What what does that mean? If you could just start with that, maybe Andreas. Thank you. Thanks, Emmanuel. Maybe I'll just do a couple of introductory comments and then leave Andreas to the meat. I think some of the you know what is the infrastructure that is at stake will come out in the presentation. But one or two further kind of introductory comments. There's a fairly long um, presentation, um, and anyone's welcome to ask for that and get a copy of it. The, the slides are fairly dense. We'll do the best we can to move rather quickly. We want to leave time for uh, questions and discussion at the end. So we'll try and cover the substantive part of the presentation in 30 minutes, which is quite a big challenge. It was a, it was a huge project, as you'll get a sense of as we go. Um, it was a huge, exciting project, so we, 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 we really enjoyed that. Just a little bit about the specific issues that we were asked to support. Um, essentially, we, we, we had to kind of help with the cost model. So, you know, what is this going to cost? Sansa had a whole lot of data, so there wasn't a shortage of data. It was more about organizing it into a kind of a comprehensive cost model. Um, we had to help them figure out in what format, how, how should this thing be packaged, and there were a couple of um, streams, not always in harmony with each other, between um, infrastructure that South Africa and uh, who was th thinking of new ways of of kind of presenting stuff. I think at the end of the day, the, the kind of the structure and the gravitas of the treasury approach um, held sway. So it was important for 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 the structuring about how how must how must the argument be be packaged. And then, obviously, supporting, as this was said, supporting Sansa to build the business case. This is not a GTAC business case or bankable feasibility study. It's it's about the, their documents, so it's branded as theirs. I think those are important introductory comments. Um, and then, if I can go to the next slide, um, the context. So Sansa was, has been wrestling with with two things really. I mean, many things, but two headline issues, I suppose. And we were in the fortunate position from a GTAC point of view to support them in thinking through a new business model, where where they're kind of reorganizing themselves, and rather than have uh, a divisional breakdown based on on areas of work, have a divisional breakdown on a more on a value chain basis. And really, the space infrastructure helps that agenda because it talks to establishment of capability and that has become a key pillar in in that value chain process so um and the establishment of this particular capability getting back to your question um emmanuel is is a broad suite of capabilities for for um within the sands of portfolio and you'll see some of the details that include space where that includes earth observation products and and more so it, it cuts across the breadth of what sands is doing and it's and it's huge. So let me hand over to Andreas. Again, we're going to try and do this rapidly and leave time at the end for questions because that might be more appropriate, but you have access to the detail in, in the slide deck um, if anyone is interested afterwards. Thanks, Andreas. 
hope you can see me. I'm just going to show my face. We can see you. And I'm going to say hello. And then I'm going to switch off my camera because I'm going to go back to my slides. Um, <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. And yeah, thank you for joining us. Um, because Michael said this is a fairly dense uh, presentation, as I'll try and get through it as quickly as possible. Um, and also, as at the end, very happy to have more detailed conversation. Um, maybe to start off, also just to you know, both acknowledge the rest of the team, so particularly Michael. Um, and then also we had another colleague, Natasha, who in fact built the model. So um, so I did support her, but uh, Natasha was the, the number cruncher. And then, you know, particularly a huge word of thanks to Eugene, because um, really without him, this wouldn't have happened. Um, he was really the, the technical knowledge that underpinned the work. So, um, you know, I think the, the so I'm not going to go through the, the context too in too much detail, but really the, you know, the background to this, as Andis was already indicated, was the fact that the organization was uh, in the process of kind of restructuring itself, looking at a significant growth path. Um, it was in the context where there was likely to be a long term reduction in the baseline grant it gets every year. Um, but also a recognition that, you know, the space sector or space services are absolutely critical for the country. And we'll, we'll come back to that in a, in a moment. Um, so many of the questions the board and management were asking is like within that context, how do we support growth? How do we gradually move towards a stronger commercial basis where we're actually generating our own income and at least covering our costs? Um, how do we build on the capabilities that the organization already has. And then most critically, you know, which is in alignment with the key strategic objectives of the country, how do we utilize this investment to stimulate the domestic space industry and uh, access to international markets? So the Space Infrastructure Hub, um, you know, was developed and then was approved as a strategic infrastructure project in 2020. Um, it was then submitted to the Budget Facility for Infrastructure and the National Treasury. Uh, at the time, it was not successful, and we'll come back to some of the reasons in a moment. Um, and at the same time, we also had the establishment of Infrastructure South Africa, ESA, who were really uh, appointed to manage the various SIP programs and in particular help support the packaging of, of a business case. Um, so I don't know why it's not moving. Let's try that. Um, so very briefly, for those of you who may not be familiar with SANSA, it is a Schedule 3A public entity. Uh, it's been around since 2010. Uh, well, in fact, the component parts have been around much longer, but as a consolidated entity. Um, and, you know, that in itself has some dynamics, which we can talk about. And really, the, ma the main purpose uh, for SANSA is really to support the space industry in South Africa. And now, um, you can see in, the, in the, the blocks there, there are a whole host of strategies that we've got um, so they're all the way from legislation that regulates space affairs to setting up the space agency to various policy documents including a national space policy 10-year innovation plan and then obviously some more recent strategic work so the overall purpose really of sansa um, is fivefold the first is to promote the peaceful use of out of space um, second is to foster international collaboration and in space related activities um, it's to foster research uh, in science, science and technology. So, you know, you'll you'll see it just now. There are a huge number of knowledge based uh, spin offs from investment in science activities, um, advancing our scientific engineering and technical capabilities as a country. So it's really the development of human capital um, supporting the an environment that will in, encourage and support uh, a fairly robust but relatively small uh, space uh, industry in South Africa, mainly around technology components. So that broadly, you know, that's the purpose, and I'm not going to go through this, but, you know, as you, it's in alignment with the national space policy and the national space strategy. And I think the, you know, the, if you had to think about this, there are um, like three, I would say three major legs to it. The first is that we have to maintain and support a whole host of space activities, and you'll see those in a moment, that we often don't think about, but they're absolutely critical to the functioning of the country, to our national security, to many of the activities we undertake on a daily basis. So 
that's one sort of basket of things that have to be maintained. The second is that we want to drive the development of a space industry in South Africa. So, you know, we have historically got a relatively robust uh, industrial engineering base in a lot of the components that go into the space sector. And the key driver in terms of our space strategy and, and the national space policy is how do we utilize that to grow that as an industry? And as you all know, you know, the, the real pressure is how do we grow GDP and ultimately how do we grow jobs? And this is an area where we have a unique advantage, uh, particularly in the, in the broader African context. And then I think the third element was really to look at how we can move from where we are at the moment in terms of the capabilities of products and services that SANSA can offer to something that moves to the next level, which is on the one hand about integrating different components of SANSA, uh, but they're also looking at the value addition that we can provide. Um, and, uh, you know, that's really a basis on which you can then generate additional revenues for the organization and improve its sustainability. Um, and that partly also means, you know, expanding your customer base, looking at servicing the private sector or other international organizations, and not just uh, the current kind of core base, which is primarily government. So if to just give you a little bit of background, and, you know, and I'm sorry I'm going through this quite quickly because this is actually incredibly complex. And, you know, and for my side, you know, this was one of the, the exciting bits around this project, having to learn a whole lot about the space economy and space industry. But in broad terms, the space economy are all of those activities and resources and provide value to human beings in the course of exploring, understanding, managing, and utilizing space. So it's all of those industries that use, that utilize space in some form or another, uh, and all of those public sector institutions that utilize space in one form or another. And you can see immediately uh, we're talking about uh, an entire value chain that spans the production of components, uh, of things such as satellites or satellite dishes, all the way to the kinds of data you gather and then what you do with that data, uh, utilizing the data to drive certain activities or to support certain activities. So in the language of the space economy, we talk about space infrastructure, which at the most simplistic level is a set of ground stations. So these are typically, if you drive around the country and you went to a couple of these, there would be sites with large antenna um, that are really used to download data and also to guide vehicles. Um, then there are launch vehicles, so that's typically rockets. Um, you know, some most of you probably would be familiar with the current uh, drama in the US, uh, SpaceX and others. Um, and then there are satellites, which we're all quite familiar with, but that's almost the core of this, where satellites uh, are really, uh, you know, serve, serve multiple purposes. Different satellites have different uh, specializations. So some of them are multi-purpose, but you know most of them are around either collecting data or transmitting data from one point to another. Then you have a set of space-enabled applications, which um, you know for for many of us, I think you know before I did this, I, you know, I was never really thought about it, but really navigation, uh, navigation equipment, satellite phones, uh, meteorological services, so weather services. All of those are applications that are heavily reliant on space infrastructure. So your ability to do you know, navigation, to track satellites, to track ships, to, to track uh, storms and weather events, um, you know, to do high resolution uh, photo photography. These are all uh, outputs of a space infrastructure. So if you think about the space value chain, you've really got uh, manufacturing, uh, which is really the, the kind of heart of the development of the components. You've got, uh, then you've got space operations and you've got space applications, and then you've got a range of enablers. So, you know, I think the, the, the huge economic value of a sector like this is that it has a range of spillover effects in terms of uh, research, university activities, engineering. Um, so it just isn't just about the, the kind of immediately putting a satellite into space. It's about the components that go into that, but it's also about downloading the data, what you can do with that. And as you are all quite familiar with kind of where we're going at the moment, think about something like, you know, the apps on your phone, uh, you know, be able to 
to geospatially code activities. Um, increasingly, we're heavily reliant on utilizing this kind of data and then building applications from that data that can positively impact uh, your, your daily life. So this is just a, a visual picture of what that space value chain looks like. So typically you've got manufacture, components, satellite systems, launch vehicles, then you undertake a satellite launch, then you have satellite operations. Um, so you've got to track and download the data, then you've got a variety of service providers that are using satellites. So whether it is Earth observation, remote sensing, you know, so for example, even in something as uh, seemingly very distant from space, agriculture, increasingly big industrial agriculture, is heavily reliant on the information that's provided through satellite communication. Uh, we're all aware of communications, so your cell phone technology and others, research and scientific endeavors. And then there are value added services. So it's, you know, a lot of this is what gets done by the private sector or by academic and other institutions where you're aggregating the data, you're either reselling it, you're repackaging it, or you're doing analytics or integrating it. So that's where the value addition comes from. So just very briefly to say, you know, part of the, the motivation for something like a space infrastructure hub is to try and tighten this integration across the space value chain. The component parts of SANSA, and we can maybe talk about it a bit later, were originally distinct entities that were then combined. And part of the work that we had to do, and not just in the business case, but the work that Michael was driving around the organizational redesign, is to look at how you can more effectively integrate those different components so that you can address this entire value chain and most critically grow the value added services because many of those value added services require better and more effective integration. In terms of SANS's current capability, it has the ability to do almost all of these activities. So the only thing we don't do, and there isn't any intention to do it in the, in, in, in the near future, is to build and launch a vehicle. So basically rocketry. Um, and the simple reason for that is there are many service providers globally that we're not competitive in that space. But we do have a strong capability in manufacturing components, satellites, and then definitely on the operation side and on the services and the value added services. Um, just to give you a bit of a quick picture, you know, I mean, I think we often aren't very aware of this, but we actually have a relatively well developed space sector it is not as big as many of the other economic sectors, but it is a robust sector that is growing. Um, many of these are not names that you will be familiar with in your, your daily work, but some of them you will be, you know, like the, the for example, the, the car tracking companies. I mean, the Matrix, Netstar, Car Track, those are obvious and most people would know about that. Um, Many of the others are going to be, are highly specialized. They operate in particular sectors. But the point we wanted to make here is that we've got a, a strong upstream, downstream, and midstream sector. And, and really, one of the things we wanted to do with the, the Space Infrastructure Hub is to put a significant public investment into this ecosystem so that these organizations can grow and expand. These organizations so either suppliers in terms of components or technology, or they're utilizing the data. So the ability to have data is increasingly valuable. You know, if we have to buy data on the, I mean, you know, I remember going through the business case at the initial stage, just looking at the costs of, for example, buying imagery from, from international sources. We're very dependent. Uh, it's very expensive. There's a forex issue. So, you know, the extent to which we can build our own industry not only provides a kind of a feedstock for this for this economy, but is also a way of ensuring increased uh, sort of national security so that we actually aren't entirely dependent on other players uh, globally. So getting directly sort of into the, the SIH um, you know, and our response to the to the request, I think the first thing that had to be recognized, um, and I must say this was an important step, it took us a while and it took us a number of interactions, is to recognize that the SIH is a very large and very ambitious investment program. So yes, it builds on the infrastructure, the capability of SANSA, but I think as um, and this was already pointed out, we're talking, you know, the, the initial proposal was, you know, in excess of a tenfold increase in both the, the budget and in the staffing and other components. So it was a massive step change for SANSA. Um, and the concern was that given the fact that SANSA itself was being restructured, um, the, you know, the risks associated with going for the big bang approach uh, that, you know, initially was asking for about four and a half billion rand uh, as an initial investment uh, seemed to us to be too ambitious. Um, and that really what we wanted to do is 
find a way in which you could run a process to pair this back and create sufficient confidence in government uh, that the project is actually viable and can be successfully delivered by SANSA. Um, I'm not going to talk to this, but I think you know the key point that we wanted to make is that SANSA historically were these discrete businesses that have been put together. Michael and some other colleagues uh, spent a lot of time trying to think through a new business model design. Um, and I think at the heart of that business model design, and if I've got it here, I, didn't, I think I took it out, sorry. Um, at the heart of that business model design was to reorganize the, the, the business on a value chain basis rather than these discrete uh, units which have historically operated at. So to think much more around how you link and inter, uh, integrate the services that the, that the organization provides. Um, not to say that, you know, this is a work in progress and I think, you know, big uh, changes have occurred and there's a lot of movement in the space. But, you know, just to jump ahead, one of the challenges in the business case was to try and get the various business units within SANSA to cooperate and share information and make sure that we have a coherent single story to tell about the space infrastructure hub. Um, I'm not going to spend much time on this, but it's just really, a, you know, what we were trying to illustrate is to say, you know, where, where is the organization right now? You know, in 2019, uh, 20, you know, you're talking about an organization with a, you know, a 340 million rand budget. And, you know, you're looking at over the next 10 years, uh, you know, a 17 fold increase. That was the initial plan. So while the ambition is very good, I think the anxiety, you know, from, uh, for example, the colleagues at uh, the budget uh, in facility for infrastructure was that this is a huge step up, you know, and where is the plan? How do we how do we know that we can achieve this? What needs to be in place? And can we break this down in a way that we can address some of those risks, given the fact that uh, just as you could hear me talking earlier about the nature of the sector, it is a very complex space. It is there's an enormous amount of implementation and technical complexity, um, and there has to be a significant amount of funding up front by government. And the question is, what is that quantum that is going to give us the best uh, return uh, at this point in time? So how did we respond to the assignment? So I think we, you know, when we got the sort of initial brief after scoping it and spending some time with the, with the Sandra colleagues, um, we kind of went through three sort of phases of work. The first was really scoping it and getting an understanding of what is required, confirming what a bankable feasibility should contain. And I'll come back to that just now. I mean, there were some challenges there. Um, reviewing the scope with uh, of the SIH with the SANSA Exco. And what we ended up uh, agreeing after some workshopping is that we would split this process into two phases and our initial focus was on phase one uh, which we saw as a scaled back business case so it was really about establishing the baseline capabilities using the current expertise that existed so not making too many major leaps uh, in terms of you know what what needs to be in place or how many people we would have employed but to say what do we have at the moment that we can leverage effectively um, let's look at a way in which we can prove an appetite for the capabilities that both address the short-term needs of, of SANSA to grow as well as the industry. Um, look at a much lower quantum in terms of the overall investment requirement from, from government. So you know, recognizing that we are in a fiscally constrained a space and that what we need to do is kind of prove that this can actually work and rather break it up. Um, you know, so just give you a very simple example, you know, the initial proposal uh, included you know, more than a dozen satellites being built. Um, and these are generally high risk items. They are complex. There is a level of failure. Um, and our view as well is scale that back. Let's rather do fewer. Let's demonstrate that we can actually deliver and build them locally. And then once we've proven that, then hopefully uh, we have a basis for future investment. Um, I think the other thing that we really wanted to do is provide a basis for commercial and profit generating capabilities. So one of the, the items in the business modeling that was very critical was to try and pair back on the investment required um, that would not be covered by the initial funding. So there was a huge risk with the initial proposal that we would need to scale up very significantly in terms of people and other resources. And the payback on that would be very extensive, very, very extended. So um, the big risk then is that the project is going to run at a deficit for 
uh, a very long time. And what we needed to do is get those two slightly better aligned, which I think we have managed to achieve with the model. And then phase two was really about looking at the full expansion. Um, let me say that one of the, the complexities here was that the original brief was to look at a bankable feasibility study. And typically, you know, in the in the infrastructure finance space, when you talk about a bankable feasibility study, it's usually bankable, which means private sector financing. And certainly the kind of ESA brief, so Infrastructure South Africa, is very much about driving private sector finance. Um, in the early stages of the project, you know, we did uh, some inquiries. I spoke to some people in the infrastructure finance space, and it was very clear that globally, this is not a sector that gets an enormous amount of private finance. Um, and in particular, that's because of the huge risks involved. So um, the one area where there has been a bit of an increase in private finance is really on the launch vehicles, um, but it's still relatively minimal. And in most countries in the world, this is really the initial investment is a public sector investment that needs to underwrite the overall risk. So I think, you know, with that in mind, you know, we also approach the business case in a way to say, OK, well, let's recognize that. Let's make the argument for government to, to do the initial, call it seed investment. And if we can demonstrate that over time we can actually deliver these vehicles and we can launch them, then the, you know, the, the, the view was that you could still then go to the market and look at other financing options. But at the moment, the risks and the, the level of I don't know the unknown questions were too great to really expect any immediate private sector participation. Um, I think so I discussed this earlier, but I think one of the key things we adopted in de designing the, the kind of business case was to think about the organizing principle and the organizing principle we decided would be the value chain um, to look at how we integrate these different components, uh, the capability establishment, the operations, and then ultimately the decommissioning. And what we really wanted to do is try and break down the silos, you know, so because that was one of the big challenges that when you're trying to put together a business case and every unit in the every you know, space science or space operations, earth observation would all come forward with their own investment plans, with their own expansion plans. So a lot of the work that was done in the business case was an attempt to try and kind of consolidate that and create a single SIH view that integrated all of these different functions. Um, in doing so, you could also start looking at those areas where there was duplication. So we could eliminate areas of overlap. So we could work out, well, if we're going to invest in this, what do we need to invest in elsewhere? Or do we even need to invest because we've already got that capability? So it is really about thinking through you know, how we break the silos and how we also think about dependencies and risks. So one of the challenges with having a silo-based approach is that people wouldn't always think about what was necessary for their own function to work. So, you know, there's no point in having building a satellite if you aren't making the uh, commensurate investment in ground station and technology capability. So, um, and that's really at the heart, I think, of, of what we try to push in the, in the overall SIH model. In terms of the actual building the business case, um, you know, it was a very interactive process. Um, I must say, uh, you know, I've, I've done an enormous number of business cases across the public sector, and this was definitely one of the most interactive ones where, you know, SANSA definitely bought into the process, added enormous amounts of value. I don't think we could have delivered it without them. We're very engaged, provided the data, we're willing to go through many, many workshops, many iterations, uh, provide us with the data, explain to lay people <laughs> what some of these components are and how it works. So for me, that was really the, the critical process here was this really interactive process um, with workshops, engagements, and and reiteration. You know, I think um, sometimes I think people got a bit frustrated because, you know, we seem to be going over the same territory, but I think all of that was very important because it really crystallized the storyline. So what is the SIH about? Why are we doing this? What do we hope to achieve? And then I think most critically, you know, what this also showed this process is that having a robust financial model can be very important. So, I, I mean, I don't know if Natasha's on the call, but this was an incredibly difficult exercise because you have to build it from scratch, from, you know, different pieces of information across the organization to create a consolidated picture that takes into account the various 
capital investment requirements, but also what are the human resource and OPEX requirements. But the immense value of the model is that you could then start seeing how it all hangs together and then we could start adjusting it. So running scenarios, we could then say, okay, what's going to work, what's not going to work, what gives us the best value for money at this point in time, given the funding we want to look for. Um, oops, sorry, what have I done now? Sorry, sorry, excuse me, I just hit the wrong button. Um, I, I, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I am I'm conscious of time, but um, you know, just to give you a sense of kind of what we did in terms of the components of the business case. So the first was really building a justification. So and that's really looking at the strategic uh, and other underpinnings of the current SANSA work as well as the national space strategy. It was also important for us to understand the requirements of a bankable uh, business case. Um, and I'll raise the issue here, but I, I've kind of summarized it in my concluding slide is that, you know, one of the big challenges we had is that we had two competing approaches. So there is the, you know, the capital projects approach that Treasury has adopted through the BFI, and they have a guideline on what they expect in a, in a bankable business case. Um, and then we have Infrastructure South Africa, which is a relatively new institution um, that has adopted the, the UK five case model. Um, and we kept bouncing between the one and the other. So because ESA is responsible for SIPs, you know, we, we consulted with them and they would say, can we have the five case model? Then we would go to Treasury and Treasury would say, well, actually, we're the paymaster. So can we please have the business case in our format? Um, so that is one of the challenges we did experience. And we sort of navigated our way through that. But I think you know, it was important for us to understand what is required. Um, also, you know, what we did at the justification stage was just to look at the international literature and understand you know, what are those, what are the economic and the commercial viability parameters of, of space projects? So that was really, you know, using interviews, workshops and literature review. Then we looked at options. Now, the, I'll, I will be upfront and say, I think the options analysis was one of the most complicated things to do because a lot of the business cases we do are options typically around institutional options uh, or maybe business model options. Whereas here, you know, the, the options are very complex. They relate to technology, they relate to phasing, they relate to different procurement methodologies, and they relate to different ways of, of delivering the operations. So this took many iterations uh, to try and get something together that really made sense uh, and would enable us to navigate the delivery of the business case. The socioeconomic analysis is also another very challenging area. So, you know, and I think the, the issue here is that the data available in South Africa and the so sort of understanding of the space sector is very, very limited. So typically what you would do here is you would look at socioeconomic benefits like employment or GDP multipliers and broader developmental impacts um, and things like technology transfer and commercialization. Um, but we, you know, we really struggled with this because there isn't a good baseline data set that tells us about the industry around levels of employment, the level current levels of contribution to GDP. I mean, for those of you who work with national statistics or accounts, you will, or even the standard industrial classification system, you'll know that there is no such thing as the space sector. It comprises bits and pieces from a num number of sectors. So it is a big challenge. Um, as we were developing the business case, the CSIR was increasing uh, its research output, um, but you know, not all of it was available at the time, but it was a, it was a challenging area. Luckily, there were some international there's some international works that we were able to use some of those international uh, benchmarks and ratios and apply it to the South African context. In terms of the financial case, I've already mentioned that we built a detailed financial model. It was a bottom up, so we we literally went down to sort of the the component parts of the infrastructure in a per satellite ground station. Uh, we looked at the costs, um, you know, luckily Sansa, led by Eugene, is a very strong engineering team, so they had all of these costs available. We looked at the products and the services that were going to be sold and looked at revenue assumptions, and then obviously the usual financial parameters, and then we, we built a number of scenarios, and that was important to guide the final sort of proposal that we put on the table. Risks and sensitivities, um, yes, a lot of energy went into this, and as you know, you, you know, it'd be evident that this is quite a risky project and has many moving parts, uh, but we spent quite a bit of time trying to define those risks and address them. And many of those risks were addressed by actually phasing the overall program. So breaking down the SIH into a phase one and then follow on phases, because that reduced the risk in terms of, you know, not, we're not going to do 12 satellites, we may 
2022, uh, the less requirement for initial funding. We knew that we could accommodate the, the growth requirement in Sansa within the existing resources. So um, there was a lot of work done on that and also looking at some of the trade-offs. You know, So there are certain things. So to give you an example, you know, if you want to stimulate the local industry, um, you have to run a very different kind of procurement approach. And part of that is, is a trade-off. You have to accept the fact that you know, it may be high, higher risk, it may take a bit longer, um, you know, it may have a whole lot of smaller players that need additional support. So if it was purely about time and money, uh, you know, we could deliver all of this by just simply buying in the technology from elsewhere and that's it. But given the fact that we wanted developmental spin-offs, we had to think quite carefully about how you structure the actual delivery process. And that relates really to the procurement strategy. So what's the timing and the phasing? How do we make sure we comply with the rules of, of procurement, government procurement, but also maximize the impact? You know, how can we uh, break down components in a way that we know that there are local firms that can respond? And then finally, we, we had to look at institutional and operational readiness. So document, documenting the current organizational capability, um, as well as the fact that they've established a PMO and have existing systems and procedures. Um, the good thing there is that, you know, because Michael and some of the other colleagues were working on the organizational design, uh, a lot of that information was available and you know, we had a good sense of what the organization's capability was. So I think that gives you some sort of sense of the overall process. And given the time, I'm going to take another two, three minutes and then I'll open it for, for discussions. But what I want to do is just give you some sense of of the outputs. I mean, it's a fairly long business case. Um, and I think it took us quite a while to, to package it in a way that actually created a coherent narrative. And I think one of the, the challenges in this space was to try and communicate something that is very technical uh, to people who don't necessarily work in the space industry every single day. And I think that was one of the, the I think the, the value adds of the GTAC Sansa interaction is that Eugene and the colleagues could give us the technical detail we could try and translate that into an argument and into a storyline that you could then take to ESA or to Treasury. So in terms of outputs, as I said, we looked at the justification. What are the kind of potential benefits? Uh, you know, and there were a number of those, a new business model, knowledge-based economy, growth in products and services. We looked at options. So I've just given you some sense of the kinds of options we looked at. You know, what are the phasing, what are the phasing options, what are the delivery and procurement options? Uh, they all had a different risk rating and they have different impacts. So we, we agreed on a set of criteria. So, for example, you know, we want to contribute to the development of South African space industry. Now, you know, we could buy in all the technology we need, but that's not going to make any difference to the local industry. So, you know, that so the, the options matrix effectively helped guide some of those decisions. We looked at the socioeconomic benefits. Um, you know, I think this was a challenge and I think it still remains a challenge given the paucity of the data. Uh, but we looked at some of the international literature, some of the qualitative assessments, um, and then using some work that had been done by London Economics for the UK government, uh, we developed uh, you know, an initial high-level analysis of what this investment might deliver to the South African economy. So you know, looking at the, just the CapEx investment over 10 years, you know, you know, the estimate is we're looking at about uh, you know, 14 billion rand in terms of direct return from a three and a half billion rand capital investment. Um, but, and if you start adding in spillover effects or you add in contributions to the public good, um, it has a much bigger impact. Then we also looked at as the financial modeling. So we built the detailed model. Uh, in terms of SANSA, in terms of SIH phase one, uh, there was a need of about three and a half billion rand over the first 10 years, uh, of which 1.3 billion rand was for the MTEF. Now, you know, I think the important thing about this is that you can see in this graph that you know, we could clearly then work out how much capex do we need when, rather than just going to Treasury and saying, well, you know, we need 10 billion rand over, you know, and give it to us now. So we could have a much stronger argument, a much stronger tie into the component parts. Equally important, the model also demonstrated that it's not just simply about the capex, but if you want to derive value, you also need to make sure you have the budget for the opex, so for operations and for people. And then you also need money for R&D and business development. So, you know, we're looking at developing an industry. So there has to be money made available to support the industrial partners to develop our new R&D capability in our science councils or universities. And then equally important, what we did is that you know, the, the model considered the life cycle of the infrastructure, 
So it wasn't just about the immediate build, but over a 10 year cycle, there was very clearly a second wave of investment required. Um, and that was really uh, to replace uh, much of the infrastructure that would be aging at that point in time, as well as bringing on stream some new, some new infrastructure. Uh, as I said, the financial model kind of split up CapEx, OpEx, um, and you know, we kind of broke it down into kind of the various components. So we could say, you know, how much of it would go to satellites or antenna or earth observation equipment uh, or replacement CapEx. Uh, we built a cash flow model. Um, and really what the cash flow model starts to show you is, you know, when does this project start generating uh, a positive return, so a surplus. Um, and, you know, I think this was very important because this is the way we could then also adjust our uh, expectation in terms of the funding requirement from government. So the very first submission had just come up with a, a large number, whereas I think now we could be much more precise and say, okay, if we get, you know, this government investment, the red bars, uh, then equally as we're investing, we're able to grow our own revenues uh, and then at a point in time, which in this case is by year five, we actually start showing a surplus. So in fact, we're we're starting to generate uh, more income than we're actually expending on the infrastructure and services. Um, yeah, as I said, we the financial model had a number of scenarios. Um, we looked at the net present value and the IRR of these scenarios. Um, and through that, we could then determine, you know, what is the, the peak cash shortfall? Um, which is also very important from a budgeting perspective because it enables us to go to treasury in a constrained environment and say okay look you know if we can get this amount of money next year and this amount of money the following year we can still deliver this rather than going with a, you know a request that says we need three and a half billion rand today um and then we could look at the overall government funding requirement uh for the for the project um as i mentioned we did a, a fairly complex uh, risk matrix and then we looked at the procurement strategy and that, you know, SANS has got a very well developed procurement framework, um, strongly tied into, you know, quality control engineering standards um, that, you know, it's ISO certified to European space standards. So that was kind of, you know, relatively simple for us to put into the business case. And then we looked at institutional and operational readiness, looking at the skills that are available, the, the advantages of SANS in terms of its track record, and also the fact that for this project, a program office has been has been created. So I think a couple of last two slides, then I'll stop and I'll take questions. So I think, you know, kind of overall, you know, what I think we achieved, um, I think what we managed to do is take a very complex, um, uh, overly ambitious program and make it into something that is a more digestible and well-structured proposition. So just to give you this picture on the left here, was one of our early workshops, I think it was down in Hermanus. Uh, we spent a day together and we just mapped up all of the bits and pieces from all the business units. What do they want? What do we need? And we put this down. And in fact, this looks even tidier compared to the big pieces of paper on the floor. Um, and I think what's very evident is that it's very complex. There are lots of parts. Um, so you try and explain this to somebody and say, well, this is the Space Infrastructure Hub. Please give us uh, three and a half billion rand. It was a very difficult ask. Where we've ended up with is that, okay, this is actually what the SIH is about. Okay, so in phase one, we've got, you know, the value chain. So we're looking at satellites, ground station, data processing and products and services. What are we actually going to do with the money? Well, we're going to invest in satellites. We're investing in ground station capability. We're going to expand our existing uh, capabilities in data processing. And then we're going to build a whole new market facing platform in enhancing our sales and improving our pricing generating new products and services and broadening the market we service. So I think, you know, and then underpinning all of that is really the kind of core competence around program management and systems engineering and being able to stimulate the industry. So, you know, I think that's really, you know, it looks simple, but it's a lot of work and a lot of thinking that went into this to try and make it very clear around what is the money we're, you know, we're spending, what are we spending it on, and what is it going to deliver? So I think maybe my last slide is just to, simply summarize some of the lessons from this project is I think you know what worked well I think the cooperation and collaboration between GTAC and Sansa I, I, I certainly from my side I thought it was really really powerful um, you know we could draw on Sansa's engineering and technical expertise uh, we could supply them with the business case financial modeling and, and the government system experience um, I think that interaction enabled us to translate a complex 
technical proposition into something that uh, was a business proposition that could be understand understood by government. Um, I think you know one of the other things that I think it did highlight um, is that we sort of worked through sort of the end stages of COVID, and it was quite interesting that I, and I think we probably would not have got some of the breakthroughs we did on this project if we hadn't met in person. So the value of physical workshops, um, I think, can't be underestimated. I think it made a big difference. Um, I think the the other thing that was very important was regular engagement and support from both Infrastructure South Africa and the budget facility. Um, you know, and, and it was good to get the guidance. You know, I think it was useful to bounce things off to get a sense of what would they be looking for in the business case to test the logic of the argument. Um, so I think, you know, we we valued those interactions, you know, being aware that ultimately, you know, look, they had a they have a regulatory responsibility, so there's only so much they could do, but uh, they were certainly uh, willing to help guide us. Um, I think the development of the financial model was absolutely critical. Um, you know, I think in these kinds of assignments, if you want to make the right decisions, you need to have powerful evidence. And I think financial model is one of those key inputs that can really support decision making. And I think overall, probably most critically for me is the full ownership of the process and the product by the client. You know, so I think uh, it was, you know, from from the GTAC side, it was very clear that Sansa owned this. This was a Sansa product. Um, they were committed to it. They put in the hours. I mean, Eugene put in many, many long hours and many weekend and other evening engagements. You know, and I think that that was very, very important. Um, so that there was full ownership. And I think, you know, they've taken that that whole process and the whole business case forward. What were some of the challenges? I mean, they weren't that many i mean not not more than kind of any other usual sort of project but i think as i mentioned earlier the the kind of uncertainty with respect to the business case format so we kind of got to be very blunt we kind of got caught in some of the institutional politics you know between the treasury and the and infrastructure south africa um so i don't know these typos there i didn't see those apologies um you know and i think this basically resulted in some iterations and significant edits you know so when you're restructuring it from a BFI framework to a five case framework was was a bit of a pain, but you know, nothing insurmountable. Um, I think you know one of the other issues that I think were, was a challenge was the ability to translate the very innovative and technical nature of the proposition. Um, you know, given the fact that the team on the GTAC side were not space experts, um, you know, we had to look at ways in which we could explain things in relatively simple terms. But at the same time, recognize that this is not a, you know, you're not building a bridge or a road. Uh, data and evidence are not readily available. You know, I mean, many other sectors, you know, we have a long history of norms, ratios, or socioeconomic impact assessments. A lot of that is relatively unknown. So it's, it's quite hard to then make the, the case. So I think, you know, this really, we had to address this with a process to structure the information and the story and also identify proxies for key data. So you know, we didn't we didn't always have a, the, a kind of a single number that could tell us about the sector. So we looked at other other ways of explaining the, the size and the complexity of the sector. And then, yeah, COVID-19 was a was a bit of a challenge. So initially, a lot of what we do, we did was kind of remote uh, teams and Zoom. Um, but I think it did slow down the overall process. I mean, that's certainly my observation that uh, I certainly felt once we could meet in person, things moved uh, much more strongly. Um, anyway, I'm going to stop there for now. Um, sorry, I, I know that was a fairly long presentation and a large mouthful, but uh, I'm going to open it up for for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas. That was very, very uh, well done to try and explain so much in actually 45 minutes. Well done. I'm going to open the floor here to questions, comments. Maybe Eugene from Sansa wants to come in. Uh, I've got a first hand from Tabiso, Tabiso Tebe. Can you just say where you are from? Thank you, Chair. Um, so I'm from the Jobs Fund. And uh, thank you for the lovely presentation. It was quite informative. So my question is really, um, how long would such a business case have taken? And um, my second question is, has uh, Santa also looked at um, collaborating with uh, companies, outside companies like SpaceX, particularly SpaceX? I'm, I'm just curious if um, there's been any work done there to 
get them to bring in skills here. Thank uh, thanks, Tabi. So there's a second hand from Butumil Washilo. I think we can take those two. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Emmanuel. Good afternoon, uh, colleagues. And uh, thanks for the for the presentation. Two questions that I have questions, comments. Um, the the first one is around the what I would call the value proposition. I I'd like to get some comments on what would we have missed if we didn't have, uh, you know, this investment that uh, Sansa wants to make. And I'm asking this because we often have to answer the question of, uh, do we have to build it uh, here in South Africa, or can we rely on uh, third parties to provide us with that kind of a service? And uh, in that way, we are covered. OK, that's my first uh, question. The second one is when government decides to fund this kind of a program where we have the clients that are also coming uh, from the private sector, sorry, public sector, and I know it's not just public sector. The one of the questions that we also have to answer is around pricing and say, by government providing the initial uh, funding, did we lower the tariffs that uh, you know the the clients, uh, including the government clients, would have had to pay, or we were just making uh, or improving the uh, capability of uh, Sansa, and we should be treating tariffs uh, or pricing uh, as a separate issue. Uh, all together. Um, yeah, and those are my two questions. I would just like to have some thoughts on those. Thanks, uh, Andreas, Michael. Yeah. I mean, I'll start, but it would be good if maybe the colleagues from Sansa could also jump in. Um, so I think on the timeline, um, I'm just trying to remember, it was about a year, huh, Michael, from beginning until we end it. Uh, yeah, but the, so it was, the, the final stages, um, it, we formally ended, I think, nine months after we started, but there was some trickling over beyond that. Yeah. yeah. yeah but it took about a year for, yeah. for this process to unfold. Um, yeah, so I think that's, that's the one comment. I mean, I think in terms of partnerships, I mean, the colleagues from Sansa can, can give more detail, but, you know, I think one of the things that is important and what we try to highlight also in the in the business case is that Sansa does have a range of very strong international partnerships. So not necessarily with SpaceX, but in particular with with NASA, for example. Um, and what the investment in the SIH does is also creates a platform for much uh, enhanced and strengthened partnerships. So the fact that we have the capability means that players like NASA are willing to come to South Africa make investments here and work with us. So, um, you know, maybe the Sansa colleagues can jump in just now in terms of some of the other partnerships. So it's definitely part of the overall argument we wanted to make. Um, going to Boitemelo, yeah, this is kind of where it gets a bit more challenging. But I mean, I think, look, I mean, I think in the business case, what we've said is you could do this without, uh, you know, without building anything. We could go and buy all of it in or we could go and contract international providers. Um, the, there are a couple of downsides. So the one is that we then are increasingly reliant on international third parties. Um, and given the the kind of politics around space um, and the fact that it often is linked to a variety of geopolitical movements, there is a huge risk that we could be extremely exposed. You know, So if we, for example, can no longer buy in certain data um, which supports you know, key industries like you know, weather or, weather or tracking or other things, then we, we really are impacting on our national sovereignty. Um, you know, so I think there's an important issue there around national sovereignty. The second issue is also that you know, the, the explicit intention of government's investment isn't just to make sure that the service is available, but it's also to support local industry. So, you know, this is one of the sectors where we've identified that um, we have some comparative advantage, especially when you look at the rest of Africa. I mean, you know, and, um, we can build on that and we can grow this industry. We can export, um, we can reduce 
our, our reliance on, on kind of forex payments um, for, for international technology. So there's a level of, of security of supply um, which that that'll enable us to to deliver and then obviously build a local industry so I think that would have been the downside of not doing this um, and I, let me just also add that I think one of the issues that we also were quite conscious of is that many other countries particularly in Africa are starting to increase their investment you know so countries like Egypt and, and Nigeria and others you know really are growing this sector and we currently have a lead position but if we want to retain that we need to make this investment in terms of pricing yeah, that's a very tricky one. So, I mean, I think the the overall intent was not really to lower the cost, um, partly because at the moment most government clients aren't actually paying anywhere near the real cost, and many of them don't pay at all. So, like many other government programs, collecting our money from government clients is a big challenge. Um, but you know, I don't think we we really ultimately were looking at at lowering those tariffs. Um, I mean, maybe that is an effect in the long run in terms of improved efficiencies um, to the extent that we don't have to buy in certain things and where we're paying in Forex. Um, obviously, that would be something that would translate through to to the price. But yeah, maybe I don't know if the colleagues from Sansa want to add. Yes, Andreas, if you if you wouldn't mind, I see there's another hand, but if we can quickly uh, just deal with these questions. Um, let's start quickly with the collaboration. Uh, so you, you hit the nail right on the head, uh, Andrea. So we have a strong collaboration and we are very much uh, embedded in the global space uh, sector. Uh, and we have many international uh, 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 collaborations, uh, both in terms of, of, of working together and in terms of uh, um, uh, economic uh, uh, interactions. Uh, you mentioned NASA, for instance, uh, we're looking at get, having them as a client going forward, but then we have very, very good interactions with people like the European Space Agency, where we we take a lot of learning from them and, and applying it also in, in our uh, environment. Of course, um, uh, modifying it to fit our conditions uh, more specifically. Um, I think the question was specifically around SpaceX. Now, SpaceX is a bit of a, a odd one out. They are, are such an incredibly commercially focused entity. Even in the international space community, they are a little bit almost separate uh, in, in the way they operate. They are so focused on their bottom line that they literally almost makes no attempt to, to uh, interact with anybody outside of, of commercial arrangements. So, so yeah, so SpaceX, they are a very successful company, but they are, are very single-minded in their approach to, to what they do. Um, and it's actually quite difficult to collaborate with them, not just from South Africa's point of view, but from the international space uh, industry's uh, point of view. Quickly on, on on the why, why not just buy everything? Um, so I think, Andreas, I think you, you addressed most of the sentient points there. Um, it's all about the, the issue of the capable state. Um, why ultimately do we do anything? Um, so I think it, it it really it just makes us a more capable. St apart from the um, points you mentioned, Andreas, around sovereignty and and all the geopolitical political uh, risks and, and reliance with third parties, um, it does make us a, a capable state and just advance us as a as a as a player in the in the, in the broader um, uh, broader uh, arena for for space and space applications. And in terms of pricing, I think ultimately I think the saving there would be that. Um, uh, we in South Africa should be able to do uh, everything a bit more efficiently. And so I think there would at least in, in, in the, at the minimum be a saving for for people in terms of the, the cost of the product uh, being a, a local developed product and um, the pricing structure uh, built around local currency and, and so forth. So hopefully that was some some additional information. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Eugene. Um, we basically have three minutes left to this webinar, so I would like to give Bulelwa the floor and then we'll wrap up. Um, thank you, Chair. My name is Bulelwa Lupelwana from uh, the Eastern Cape. Um, I am from the Eastern Cape Socioeconomic um, Exec. It's quite a long name. Um, my, my question is, I think I, I'm basically covered um, with, with the collaboration, but what I didn't get is um, collaboration with um, companies like Esri, um, your, your Council for Geoscience, um, in terms of our local space. 
um, with the um, 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 embedding um, this this kind of um, data with 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 the the, the stuff that we use um, in in the country. And um, the second one uh, is the um, procurement, data procurement, uh, which I think it, it was touched on the costing. But then um, what I need to know is that how is um, the government uh, agencies or, or, or government uh, um, sector department can, can source um, this data from SANSA? Um, what, what price uh, range? Um, uh, is it going to come uh, with? And plus, it's it's very crucial to to one of the research agendas that we have on climate change. So, um, in terms of uh, sourcing um, your data, I'm quite interested in that. Thanks. Could you feel that, maybe, Eugene? Maybe I'll give it to you. <laughs> Yeah, no, OK, <laughs> I, I, I took the pregnant pause for 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 meaning exactly that. Um, so in terms of uh, collaboration with uh, people like Council for Geoscience just this week. Um, uh, so first of all, we've when we did the user requirement analysis for for the space infrastructure, app, we engaged uh, with uh, essentially the whole sector, both public and private. Um, we have realized in the past few weeks that there is one or two gaps and Council for Geoscience is, is one specific one. And we literally uh, just today set up uh, an engagement with them to try and um, make sure that uh, we are on the same page as them uh, in terms of where we're going forward. In terms of the pricing paradigm for, for the SIH, um, that's something we need to revisit uh, very uh, in, in any case. And um, of course, we would like to provide governments with the biggest benefit on value of money for money on their on their investment um, for existing data sets, which is not inside the SIH. There is um, a regime whereby certain data is actually free or free, or free to use by government. Um, it is mostly the high resolution data that uh, we have to procure from third parties uh, and then redistribute. Uh, but we have some innovative uh, licensing agreements with some of the satellite data providers uh, in order to specifically um, prevent uh, government from paying multiple times for the same data. Um, so, so that is that is the approach for existing data. Uh, what the exact pricing paradigm for the SIH uh, missions are going to be, uh, we, like I said, we, we urgently need to revisit that. Um, but um, suffice to say that uh, we're looking towards uh, giving good value for money for 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 government uh, on the generation of that. So, uh, looking at uh, preventing issues like having government pay twice, both in terms of the investment in the infrastructure and then having to buy the same data that they invested in. So yeah, so the specifics of that uh, we'll still work on, but we hope to we hope to be competitive in that sense. Thanks. Thank you, Eugene. Uh, Anita, I think we've uh, reached the end of the session, haven't we, of the time allocated? Yes, Manuel. Yeah. Um, we have. Um, so so thank I'd, you. I'd like to thank everybody and recognize that we had uh, some colleagues from Treasury in the room and we had Andrew Donaldson, who has now left. Uh, the thank you very much for an excellent presentation and a good round of questions. Thank you for your participation and we'll see you at the next webinar. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you, colleagues.